Hello, my name is Charles Sparakis, and I'm uh, hosting this tech talk for uh, Hanno Sander. He's coming in to talk about some of the work that he's done with education, robotics, and getting kids more involved in robots and technology. Uh, Hanno originally went to school at Stanford, and uh, I don't hold that against him, even if it is a second-rate school. Um, some of us went to Berkeley, but um, Hanno's actually been uh, very lucky to be able to combine a lot of his passions. Um, he's passionate about his kids, he's passionate about education, and he's passionate about technology and robots. So uh, he's quite fortunate to be able to work on all three. So without too much further ado, uh, Hanno. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, Google, for having me again. This is my third Google Tech Talk. I live in Christchurch, New Zealand, and I'm a father of two kids, a five-year-old son and a six-year-old girl. And um, every year I make it out here and talk about the new projects I'm up to. And this year I'm very excited about the T-Bot, a educational robot, my 12 blocks visual software, and the curriculum that we're developing to um, help schools roll out robot education um, um, classes. So why do we need to edu um, improve education with robots? Um, well, computers are getting smarter. Uh, Deep Blue was already more than 10 years ago and beat the best um, chess players in chess. And just recently, Watson um, beat the best Jeopardy players in common questions. So computers are getting smarter. And um, as a result, we people also need to be getting smarter, especially about technology and how it pertains to computers. So tech education needs a boost. Specifically, um, there are four subjects that I like talking about. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. And these are technical concepts that have um, a lot to do with computers, with the world around us, with software. And in order to excel at these, you need a very solid foundation. These subjects can be hard because they're abstract. Counting, um, vocabulary, reading, writing, those are much more concrete. You can point to an apple and ask a child to count it, but you can't, pound, you, you can't point at a formula. Um, you have to learn it, you have to understand it. And um, a lot of engineers become good engineers by playing with things, by playing with circuits, by, by playing with robots, or by playing with code. And so that's what we want to do more. Um, this is an image that I think illustrates very strongly that you have to do something in order to learn it. Um, I've learned how to do pottery, and I didn't learn it from a book. I didn't learn it from a video. I learned it by taking some clay, putting it on a wheel, and then feeling how um, it gradually became into a pot. And um, people guided me through it, and that's what we're trying to do with robots now. So get people, get kids playing with robots and let them learn by themselves. So a lot of science, technology, engineering, math is currently taught by books, by blackboards, and by looking at um, complicated formulas like this. Um, hopefully, robots can bridge this gap between these abstract concepts that make up the foundation of science, technology, engineering, and math, and hands-on learning that kids can do by having a handheld platform that they can interact with, they can play with, that they can call their own, and they customize to make it their own. So robots have been around for a while. Um, started um, 100 years ago, where people wrote books about them and built mechanical models of them. And only recently have they really grown to provide a very rich learning environment. And what I mean by that is that they have all the capabilities that are interesting for a wide variety of different kids. Um, some kids like to play music. Some kids like to choreograph dance moves. Some kids like to build things. And some people like to program. And a robot um, can suit all those kids and can provide a good learning environment for all those kids. So um, there's a lot of concepts that can be learned from robots. In the science area, 
by looking at experiments and learning from that, applying that to another experiment, performing measurements. There's a lot of sensors on robots in terms of measuring proximity, in terms of measuring motor current, um, technology, looking at ultrasound and infrared sensors, engineering, understanding center of gravity, making sure the robot doesn't fall over, and um, of course math, so the logic and even the simple things like how many um, degrees in a square and how do you make a square, how do you make a circle. So this is what um, I'm spending a lot of my time on these days, um, having a bunch of kids play with some software, play with a robot, and being helped by other adults um, to make it into a very satisfying experience for all. And what these kids are doing is they're controlling something. Um, typically, a kid, six, seven, ten years old, might have a dog, might have a sibling, but they don't have things that they directly control. Um, of course, they try to control as parents. Um, but robots are one of a few things that they can program, and then they can hit a button and watch as a robot does what they want to do. Um, they can create things. Um, Lego is very popular, and robots um, take that to the next level by um, combining motion, combining programming, combining it all together so that they can create very complex things. And um, customizing, um, so taking a platform that already provides a lot of functionality and adding to that, so modifying it and calling it their own. Um, so robots that are just out there and that the kids can play with are okay, but um, it's nice when the kid has ownership and can say, yes, I built this robot, I added these components, and I um, built that together. So robots um, can be used from simple demonstrations, so in physics classes, engineering classes, um, to show um, concepts like um, acceleration and measuring um, velocities. It can be used in challenges like line following, maze. Um, I'll show a video of a RoboCop dance clip later. And competitions. So there is a wide variety of competitions aimed at different, um, different ages and different capabilities. So why aren't robots in every school right now? Well, they used to be very difficult. Um, they used to be difficult for the kids to succeed with, and they are um, certainly difficult for teachers to succeed with. Teachers typically don't have a lot of time and energy and money to get started with a new product, um, and they want something that works. Um, robots also aren't in every school right now because um, they're limited and they used to be limited in functionality and too expensive. Um, so robots used to have to be soldered together and um, screwed together, and then you had to program. So to be successful, you really needed to be an expert um, electronic engineer, a computer scientist, a mechanical engineer, in order to put all the pieces together. Um, nowadays, um, robots come in, can be preassembled. Um, and the code, as I'll show you in my demos, um, is much more visual and friendly to the novice programmer. There are a lot of sensors out there now, and typically they are very inexpensive. And they're much more capable than the touch sensor that we had many years ago. There's microphones, there's cameras, there's ultrasound, infrared proximity. And this makes it much easier to have a much more engaging experience um, to take the kids further. And robots used to be very expensive, um, primarily in time, so in the amount of time that it took to build something that was interesting. Um, also, of course, also in a financial sense, um, they were expensive, and we're hoping to change that as well. So I'm from New Zealand, where I live right now, and I have to show this picture wherever I go. And we are currently rolling out these T-Bots and 12 blocks in New Zealand. Um, here's a primary school with um, Macintosh computers running 12 blocks and um, with kids programming the T-Bot um, educational robot. And what they like to do is um, start simple, um, but keep it fun. 
all the way through. So I'll do a couple of demos um, with 12 blocks and with the keypad over here that shows what um, a primary school student um, typically starts with. Um, so here's 12 blocks. And um, we can start with a guided tutorial. And um, the tutorial tells us what we can do. So it guides us through this process. I can have it show me what it wants to do. And then I can even have it um, do it for me. And so I'll do some of these steps by having it do it for me. And then at some point, I'll get the hang of what we're supposed to be doing, which is taking these blocks from this library and moving them over to this work area. And so it's now telling me to move this weight block from the control section over here. And um, each one of these blocks does something. So this pause block is used to pause for a duration, and it has an argument which um, tells it how long to pause. So it's this language where it's very easy for kids to drag um, blocks around from one of each section, and then um, the blocks engage um, to each other. And then they have these parameters that define the behavior of a block. So nothing's hidden, everything's accessible. For teachers, it's easy to look at a program and see what that student's up to. Um, in this case, we want to flash this little um, light in the front, we want to flash it red, wait for a second, and then flash green. So we're going to change that color um, to green. And now we need to add one more block, which is the wait block. And so this is our first program. And we finished our tutorial, so we can close that. And now we can run this, and it'll compile it to a text language. And um, here is our red and green blinking light on the robot. Um, you can just make it out there. Um, this is live, so I can keep changing these parameters. So if I want to make it blink faster, I can change the duration of the wait. Um, so now it's um, blinking faster or slower. Um, I can also um, add some other um, blocks to this. So we can start a, another stack of blocks. And in this one, um, start reading some of a sensor input. So we can use a repeat loop again. And in this case, look at a um, sound input. And so there's read microphone. And we can read that into a variable. So we can say set x to read microphone. So what we're doing here is we're doing two things in parallel. We're blinking our light, and we're reading in the microphone. And this is loaded back on. And now we can look in the values view. And this is now plotting the value of x over time. So there's a connection from the PC with the editor and the robot. And that connection can be Bluetooth, it can be um, wireless, or it can be a USB cable. And um, we now have a um, time scale knob. So we can look at shorter and longer periods of time and it graphs these, this value of x in front of us. So if we um, clap, we can see that the value of x um, periodically goes a bit higher. We can use that as an input. Um, so we can switch to slightly more advanced concepts. So 12 blocks has either 32 blocks at the beginner level, 90 blocks advanced, or I'm going to go into expert mode. So now I have a bunch more, more blocks. Um, and we can, for example, use the um, when block and now type in a condition in here. So we'll say when x is greater than 500. Um, so now we already have multiprocessing by having two of these start blocks start um, two things running at the same time. And we'll have one that triggers based on an event. 
So this event is when the value of x is greater than 500, x being what was read from the microphone. And to make this a little bit fun, so we're doing LEDs, we're doing sound, and now let's move every time that x is greater than 500, and we'll run this. Okay. So, so far everything's good. We're still reading X in, we're still blinking the LED, and we're plotting the value of X. And now, when I clap my hands, um, the value of X goes over 500, and the robot starts to move. So it's a simple demonstration of um, what you can do with these types of blocks and um, get the kids interested in something. Um, because it's moving, it's blinking, lights, um, sounds are happening. Um, of course, there's many more blocks. Um, so in the control section, we have things like a state machine. In the T-Bot section, we have the wireless and Bluetooth connectivity. We have terminal blocks that send data back and forth. We have sound. Um, one of the interesting things here is um, this is a synthesized plucking of a harp-like instrument. So um, I'll put this block in here. Um, so um, this is all, these are all just blocks that exist in 12 blocks and rely on lower level code to get something done. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Um, and um, let me introduce this. So um, the, what we're doing with kids for competitions is taking these blocks of moving and lights and um, sounds, and one of the competitions was the RoboCup dance competition where a group of kids, um, 12 kids, um, 5 to 12 years old, took these robots and took this code and then dressed up robots in costumes and dressed themselves up and uh, took some music, choreographed some dance moves for themselves and for the robots. They had multiple robots. And then the competition was to do something creative inside a two by two meter space. And this is the result. This is the RoboCup um, Nationals in um, Wellington of last year. Okay, so that was a story of a moa, um, one of the birds that was extinct in New Zealand, um, flying around and then being speared by the hunter and then coming back to life later on. Um, and um, yeah, lots of fun. Um, so in the second demo, um, I'll build on the foundation that we did previously with some more sophisticated behaviors. So we'll look at more at variables, advanced functions, 
um, more sensors, control theory, um, and to do some fiducial um, computer vision as well. Okay. So here was our program, and um, we can add some functions to this. So um, the way you use functions is you can take one of these function headers, and then a function caller gets made for you. Um, and so we have it here. And now we can stick a bunch of blocks. Um, um, we can stick a bunch of blocks with the, in here. And now keep that in there. And these functions can refactor. So I can call this um, um, blink. Um, and so now the caller block changes. And we can give it some arguments as well. So we can um, put an argument p in there. And um, this is how long we'll blink for. So this 1,000 gets passed into this function. And p is now a argument in here. And we can wait for p in here. So that's how we do functions with this block-based um, approach. Um, and, and of course, we can have multiple functions and um, keep going. So let's run this one more time in 12 blocks, um, just to see it's working. So x is updating, and the light is still blinking. We can still change the parameters of a light. And when we clap, it still moves and plays a song. Um, for advanced programming, um, we can still stay in here and do everything we wanted to do in here. Or we can combine this with a traditional text language. So 12 blocks supports different architectures, like the parallax propeller chip, like the pickaxe, the Lego Mindstorm, the Arduino. And in each one of those cases, there is a lower level language. And just like a web page, we can take our code and we can save it. And then um, we can view at the code. We can view the code by clicking on view code. And here is this lower level equivalent of what we just typed, or what we just dragged together. So here is this function blink, and um, here is this x is greater than 500. And in this language, um, we can then um, run it. So this is just running that same code, but this time in a as a text language. And here is a different way of visualizing x. Um, from the microphone. Um, there's also a logic state analyzer in here to look at the pins from the, um, from the chip. So we can really get down to the hardware that we're running this on. We can also run a source code debugger on all this. So we can run this with um, a debugger. Um, let me switch back and... Um, just um, make it a little bit simpler. So we'll just blink one light. So we'll do this light. And we'll just do one item here. So what we're doing here is um, just setting x to the value of the microphone. Okay. And now when we view this code, and when we start the debugger running on this, now we can place breakpoints. And even though this is running on multiple processors, so the T-Bot uses a parallax propeller, which has eight cogs, so eight 32-bit microprocessors, we can stop one of those at a time. So we currently have X updating here. Um, and we can put a breakpoint in that line. And everything else will keep running on our T-Bot, except for 
the processor that's running this function of updating the X variable. Um, and um, there's also a profiler, there's also a memory map. So there's a lot of ways of debugging this code once it's running. Maybe something not for the primary age kids, but um, definitely for um, upper class one. And we can keep this running. Um, once we're familiar with the text language, um, we can make some changes in it, in it. So here we could say that instead of repeating forever, we're just going to read the microphone in 100 times, and then we'll stop. And we can save this. And now when we switch back to 12 blocks, the visual way of writing programs, um, it asks us if we want to reload it. Um, and uh, where is 12? Um, and it reloaded, and now it's saying repeat 100 times. So you can make changes in the visual metaphor or in the text language, and then switch back and forth between both of those. Let's do some demos with um, with sensors. So we already we, we know about the microphone. Um, let's switch this back to just a normal repeat. And this time from the T-Bot, there is also a sensor in the front that measures the proximity to something. Um, so here is proximity. We'll move this away. And now we can. Um, I have to run one program at a time. Okay. Okay. So now we can set X to the proximity to something in front of it. Um, and so I'll graph it over here. And now when I move this book, you can see that it's nicely measuring the proximity to that book. Um, and once we measure something, we can do something with that information. So I'm going to run a sec separate stack here. And over here, I'll drive the motors of the T-Bot. Um, and so we've already seen how we can make it move a set distance or time. And this will just move a given speed. So we'll move it um, by x. and um, Actually, we'll move it by, by z. And z will be some function of the distance. So we know how far away the book is. So now let's set z. So we'll have a variable set z to um, x minus 1,000. We notice that x is about 1,000 if we keep it this far away from the book. And um, just to be nice to the motors, we're going to restrict it to um, minus 500 to 500. OK. And then we're going to set the motors to that. OK. okay. So at first glance, not much is going on, but that's because x is already equal to pretty close to 1,000. Um, and if we look at it sideways, um, I can now control my robot by moving the book back and forth in front of it. And it's now trying to keep a set distance away from the book. So it's a very simple program. Um, it's just looking at the proximity to the book and trying to keep the motors at a value so that that distance is some value. Um, 12 blocks does have um, PID control blocks and other fancier blocks, so we could make this even more exact. Um, but that's sort of a first introduction to feedback loops for a lot of students, a lot of kids. Um, and obviously, with the same type of control, we can stay on a black line to do line following, um, or we can do more advanced um, control logic. Um, let's see, If we want to control it remotely, we can do that from within 12 blocks as well. 
So 12 blocks has interface blocks. Um, and um, just like we see X and Z on the side over here, we can put a joystick block out. It's a very old school joystick. Um, so now we're combining um, computer science programming blocks with user interface blocks. And um, I can couple this user interface into the firmware that's now running on the robot. So now instead of setting my motor to a variable that's dependent on the proximity, we can just set the motors, oh, I lost it. Um, we can set the motors to um, the value n, which is the x position here. So let's so I'll set it to the y position. Okay, so here's y and y. And now when I press run, um, nothing's moving, and um, I still get the position information. But now when I move the joystick, um, um, if I I have to multiply these by 10 in order to get um, into the range that the motors react to. So here we go, let's try this again. So Y is currently zero and my robot is parked. But now when I move this, um, I can remote control the robot just by moving this back and forth. This is me doing it manually, so by interacting with this joystick. Of course, we can plug in different peripherals. And one of the most interesting is computer vision. Um, and that's where people sit in front of a computer and um, control it remotely. So what we can do is we can use a um, fiducial um, engine. And here is reactive vision. And um, couple that with 12 blocks. So now instead of feeding it with the joystick here, I'm going to get my fiducial engine. There we go. Let's see. Um. Come on. One more try. Okay, so I'll I'll describe this one. So I have a fiducial engine here, and it's now tracking the pattern that I have on this little stick. Um, it's always writing which pattern it's recognizing. And inside of 12 blocks, there is a block, which isn't working right now, um, which is supposed to give me the x, y, and angle of this fiducial pattern. And I can then take those values and use them to control the robot. But I'll move on to the um, rest of the presentation. Um, so this next um, video is of some students using line following to find a Coke can and push that out of, outside of a maze. So they're also using the TBOD programmed in 12 blocks with the sensors to look for a black line and then at the end look for a Coke can and push that out. Okay. Um, so all these programs are very simple. Um, they take blocks and move them together, but they can be very complex. So they can go up to a lunar lander shown over here um, or beyond. And with TBOT and 12 blocks, we're now developing a curriculum that starts from primary school kids, so getting them interested and inspired by robots that they can hold, that they can attach Lego pieces, Mindstorm pieces, 
um, and VEX um, screws as well. And then at the high school level, doing more things with feedback and sensors. And at the university level, um, looking at how text languages and um, robots can do something together. 12 blocks is a nice common language. So there are now a couple people that are translating libraries and um, books written for other languages. And then from 12 blocks, you can target different processors and architectures so that the same code runs on them as well. And there is also a curriculum. Um, so from the University of Canterbury, um, a postdoc wrote um, some curriculum that maps um, specific, um, he'll bring it up, um, that maps specific achievements and standards to exercises that are done with a robot um, so that the um, students are fulfilling requirements set by the state and still actively engaged in robotics. So this curriculum, this one over here, is a robot that is looking at a black and white pattern. And by doing this exercise, kids are learning about error control coding um, and um, parity checks and using variables and arrays and f f following patterns as well. Um, and the goal of this is to make it very easy for a typical teacher to first read about the concepts that the students will be involved with and then guide them through activities um, one block at a time um, until everything's there. And um, so we're making it easy for students to learn and for teachers to teach. And at the principal level, taking this technology and making it so that it's a easy decision. Okay. So, um, besides um, the TBOT and the 12 blocks, I'm also working on Viewport, which is the debugging tool that I showed you earlier for text-based languages. Um, the PropScope, which is a analog USB oscilloscope um, sold by Parallax. Um, so it's also targeted at the educational space where it comes with a book that takes kids through um, simple DC electronics to AC electronics, sine waves, op amps, um, all with a easy to use oscilloscope. Um, I've also written um, a book and starting on another one about advanced robots. And I'm working on some projects like the America's Cup race, um, so taking some sensors and logic to improve um, the ships for racing. Any questions? So. The design philosophy of this language is sort of to take basic and replace the statement syntax with graphical blocks while keeping the expression syntax as text. Um, what motivates that cutoff? Do students really find it harder to place braces than they do parentheses? Um, so visual languages have been around for a while. Um, oh, okay. I, th I think people have, okay, I'll repeat the question. Um, so the question is about um, the cutoff between text languages and visual languages. Um, so the nice thing about a visual language is that students don't have to learn um, the language. They don't have to learn what word to type in in order to get something done. They don't need to learn the semantics of um, whether to use a curly brace, a comma, indentation. Um, and they don't need to learn about the syntax. They mainly need to learn about the, um, what blocks are available, and if they like a block, then using that block and putting it somewhere. Um, some languages are iconic-based, where they put fancy icons in these boxes, and then once you have more than five or six, it becomes pretty difficult to understand what each one means. Um, I used text in there, um, and the text describes what they're trying to do. 
the whole concept with the blocks is that it's not just representing, it's not just replacing one line of code, but it's putting everything that you need to um, get something accomplished. So importing additional libraries, allocating space, variables. So all of that is done behind the scenes in each one of our blocks. Sure, surely. Yeah. But to the contrary, in your, uh, what was it, when statement, I think you wrote x greater than 50. Um, and x was not a graphical object. Greater than was not a graphical object. Yep. And I was wondering why you drove this design halfway okay. rather than building the entire language according to a single organizing principle. OK. Um, so. Okay, the question was um, that um, I that in 12 blocks, some things are represented in visual blocks and some things are not. Some things are kept in text. And I did that very much on purpose. Um, there are other languages like Scratch um, out there where everything is kept as a visual item. And that's good for people starting out where people can um, drag together a plus um, block and then another an equal block and, and less than block. And so you're putting everything together with these blocks. Um, I made the decision to leave conditions and expressions as text because that makes it easy for people that have played with it for a little bit to type in whatever they want. So it's very free form at that stage. Um, there is, um, and what people, what, what kids typically do is that they start out not needing to type in any conditionals and um, expressions, but by the time they get to the point where they need that, they're then confident enough to use some text. They're not at that point able to type in all the different um, language elements to make something move, but they are certainly able to say, well, here is x, and here is greater than, or I'm going to multiply by 2, or I'm going to do some math, and then leave it up to the language to do it for them. Um, so it's a hybrid approach that still keeps the language syntax and semantics um, of the major language elements in the block world but it gives the people that are a little bit more comfortable, which they will be at the point that they're doing conditions and expressions, and letting them just type something instead of having to drag 20 blocks just to add and multiply a couple things together. Yep. Um, uh, kind of along similar lines, how you chose the language design, um, it seems to be very procedural, um, have a bias towards sort of a procedural view, although I like what you're doing with kind of threads and uh, events. But um, I I'm wondering, you could also kind of trick people into learning about data structures or other kind of programming concepts. I, I, for example, I don't see much in the way of data structures. Um, wh okay. What's the thinking behind that? And okay. wouldn't it be a kind of great platform to accidentally teach people even even more about programming. Um, so um, I wasn't able to show all of 12 blocks. Um, the question was about um, 12 blocks being procedural and if there was more to it. Um, so certainly I've, I've shown a little bit that there are multiple, that, that multiprocessing is easy, that um, doing event based is easy, that there are, there's a whole way of dealing with state machines. Um, so those are also first level objects in 12 blocks. And um, every one of those worksheets is a, um, is its own object. Um, and you can import other objects as well and run code in there. So you can, um, take code and let it run in its own space with its own variables and build libraries from that, go from there. Is the language in fact event-based? Um, from your example, I couldn't tell whether it, when suspends or whether it was simply iterating forever. I, I missed the first is, sentence. Is the language actually event-based um, or is the when statement actually busy waiting? 
Um, so the nice thing about the Parallax propeller is that it has eight um, processors running at all times. And so what 12 blocks is doing is allocating one of those processors to manage the events and letting the other cogs, um, the other processors deal with the other parts of a program. So when I had the um, lights blinking and another part of a program um, looking for a microphone, um, there were multiple processors running that code. So yes, one processor is busy waiting um, and is polling at all times, but the other ones are truly running on their own. They do share memory through a global memory. Um, last year I showed multiple robots sharing information over wireless. Um, so they're sharing memory in a common space and then writing sensor variables in there and running from there. Okay, thank you very much.